Uh, I'm going to start with some questions for the three of you, and then um, we'll open it up to the audience for, for, your, for their turn. Well, if I could say one thing first. Yes, please. First off, the fact that the Doc Film Festival, the largest in the world, would have us. In New York. I mean, in America, but yeah. Right. And it's premiere here in New York City, the city we were birthed. It's an amazing statement to the many who viewed the film and considered us equal to some of your other selections. But a tribute to all the guardian angels who are here, those who couldn't be here, and the support that we were able to earn from citizens here and now all over the world. So thank you. Thank you for allowing the premiere to be here. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Also, I would love to do that. If you, got, if you don't mind, any guardian angels in the audience, if you just stand, just so we can see you in your full glory in the audience. Excellent. Thank you so much. So, like I said, I'll just start with a couple quick questions for you. You addressed some of it at the beginning, but just uh, just to cover some of the bases. Uh, I'd love to know, uh, you, you provided a lot of archival material to you. I'd love to know sort of how you dealt with the archival process, how much stuff did you go through, what was the most complicated thing you had to, had to deal with? Uh, it was uh, it was thin ice for a while, I'll be honest, because we we asked Curtis to you know raid the archives for us, and uh, we didn't we didn't get a lot of the archive that you saw on the screen for a while, so we had a lot of um, cheesy stock stuff that we happily were able to take out when um, Curtis surprised us very happily one day with uh, hundreds of tapes and formats we you don't even know anymore. How somehow we dealt with it, right. so it was great. <laughs> what was the most surprising footage that you found within that sort of archive? Um, stuff, um, intimate stuff with the family, I would say. I mean, that's me personally. Um, stuff with Curtis's father. Um, and, it, you know, it, it just, it, it really framed the, the movie for us. And it helps to go back to the quote that we started with. So that was, we liked doing that. Great. Uh, David, if I can ask you sort of, what did bring you to tell this story? What, what, what inspired you within the Guardian Angel story, within Curtis's story, to want to tell this particular story? Um, I have three Curtis stories real quick. I'm just going to relay one five years old dad takes me um, uh, much against my mother's wishes to um, Lower East Side downtown where he comes from me and Jonathan my brother I just want to thank Jonathan by the way who was the script supervisor and Andrew Lawton in the back uh, Who was a co-producer? Um, anyway um, You know you would go downtown in the city and that was a scary it was a scary place It's not how it was and Jonathan and I were a little freaked out, like five and maybe three. And I remember seeing Guardian Angels, and my father was like, these are superheroes. So I was a superhero knight, so that was great. That's story number one real quick. Number two, I'm in college, and they were just huge heroes of mine. I, I kind of like found them again. And the picture of them holding Lisa, with Curtis and Lisa, was on my desktop at college. It just, it just, so that's really very emotional that I could be with him right now and have done this. It's, it's very special. Um, third crazy thing is through my father again, Bum Sensor Curtis, huge fans of his, and uh, I'm like, oh my God, I would love to do something with Curtis. The next day, as luck would have it, bumps into him again after being on this earth for 80 years, and Curtis, you know, doesn't like suits, doesn't like people from Hollyweird, <laughs> and it took what? How many dinners did we have to go through? A dozen, five or six. at least five or six dinners, and I was just listening to him go on and on and on for four hours at a time. And I knew we had a, a lot, so that was it. And, and I mean, I imagine, I mean, he's such, Curtis is such an amazing storyteller. I mean, did you know from those conversations that the, the format of the film would be sort of what it, what it is, sort of him as essentially the prime character uh, giving his own version of, of what history was for him? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I would say too, um, after the tons of groundwork that David and Curtis laid over those many dinners, I think it was over almost a year yeah. of figuring out what stories and getting all, I mean, there's more that we didn't put, obviously, a whole other documentary of stories. Sure, sure. But just already being able to pre-visualize to a certain extent and having so many stories and figuring the layout and you'd set up a camera after that and you just go, because Curtis just goes. Yeah. So that, can, was, that was amazing. I can tell. Uh, Curtis, what was the most important thing for you in, in participating in this project? What was like the main thing you're like, this has to be in the film, this is the main thing I want to convey? Well, like I said, uh, uh, before we aired, you aired the show, uh, I had been approached by many outfits from around the world who wanted to do a documentary, and they always had their own set idea. It was very artistic, but it didn't hit the core of telling the story of what it was like in those first 13 years. I don't think people realize those first 13 years 
was a complete baptism in fire. We were not well received. We were being locked up, vilified. We were called vigilantes. We were pariah. We were on the outside looking in. When Rudy Giuliani got elected, he ended that. But that was 1993. If you notice, it ends in 1992 with the shooting. And every year through, Magnificent 13, Subway Patrol, Guardian Angels, and then the crackdown on crack. It, people do not understand the, the incredible number of impediments that we had to overcome. And then I wanted it to be a piece that would inspire others. Because so often we depend on our politicians who clearly have disappointed us. I don't know what your politics is, but neither party has... Uh, stroked us. You look at the last presidential election, more people were negative towards both candidates than positive. First time in our history. Because people have given up self-help. They really think, oh, they got to wait for the Mashiach. You know, some, whether it's Barack Obama, Donald Trump, the Mashiach, going to walk on water, put gasoline in your tank, going to build your house. And that, we know they promise everything before the election, and we know, no matter how well-intentioned they are, they can barely deliver on a quarter of what they promised. So the whole concept here is self-help. You got a problem? You've got, in this case, we had young men, young women who are being vilified, who are being stereotyped as thugs, gang members. And I had to hire them in Mickey D's. And they protected me. And they kept me safe and secure. So why couldn't we just change that whole ethos and showcase what these young people were in everyday life? But nobody was paying attention, and nobody was coming up to the Bronx unless a woman was on the top of a public housing project threatening, threatening to throw her baby off or in some psychotic delusion. And we changed that whole impression of what people had, particularly of young blacks and Hispanics, that people had, become to, had started to discard and distrust. And I think that really is the representation that one man or one woman can make a difference. And you have many of those men and women right here in the audience today who've proven that, as they have now with 5,000 guardian angels in 13 countries and 130 cities all over the world. Great. I'd love to open it up to some questions from the audience. I saw your hand first of all. We have a microphone, if you just wait with one second. How you doing? Uh, I'm Eddie Brown. I'm from the Bronx. I'm in the fire department. I knew Slur Curtis many years ago. I was a guardian angel with him. And basically, the fire department didn't want to let me on the job because they said, well, you're a vigilante. So I had to go through all this resigning and the whole bit. So now I'm in the Bronx in Hunts Point, and the crack epidemic hits. And it was literally like, you know, the show The Wire, before that show came out, that was Hunts Point. They put all the drugs into Hunts Point. They were lined up in the streets. Drugs were legal, pretty much. So. They were breaking into everyone's cars. The neighborhood was complaining. So I got on the pay phone, and I was a probie on the fire department that time. And you weren't really supposed to be even heard. So I called Curtis and say, you won't believe what's going down here. And they came with the trucks, the Guardian Angels, and they broke into the crack houses. And it was really a circus that people couldn't believe. And then he would go on the radio after that and say, it's like Escape from New York in the Bronx. So the people were ha very happy to see him. Thank you. Thanks so I gotta, much. I got to tell a story about Eddie Brown. He joined early on. He was one of our trainers. Great. He's now the treasurer of the UFA, uh, Firefighters Association. So he's climbed the ranks. And they gave him a hard time when he wanted to become a firefighter. But Eddie Brown accompanied me to a few cities to help us start the Guardian Angels. One of them was New Orleans. So we're near Bourbon and Canal, and I'm talking to a group of people about the concept. Because people knew of it, but they needed it to find. And an emotionally disturbed person had a handgun in a paper bag. He pulls the handgun out. He's going to shoot me right there. I'm dead. Forget what God he did. I'm dead there, you know, in the deep south. You know, I would have been floating down the Mississippi River. Eddie Brown, to his credit, jumped the guy, got on top of him. The guy gets arrested. So me and Eddie were walking in the streets trying to recruit at night. Who do you think is back out in the streets with a hospital tag around his wrist, but the same guy who tried to shoot me earlier that Eddie Brown had sucking concrete there on Bourbon and Canal, and he saved my life. Hey, let's give a great round of applause to Eddie Brown. That's excellent. More questions from the audience. Come on. Curtis is not the only storyteller here. I know that. Anything else? Oh, yes, please, right over there. Just wait one second. 
So, oh no, it's fine. Uh, what got cut? What's the, what's the story that, that you tragically had to cut that you really wanted to tell but didn't make it into the narrative of the movie? Um, I think there was a lot of good stuff that we had, uh, the international presence that we were focused so much in New York. Um, we wanted to just to, to really zero in and not, not get lost, you know? But there, there is so much internationally and archival stuff too. That's what I would say. So can, just real quick, Curtis, how much are you involved with the chapters that are all over the country and all over the world? What, what, is, your, what is your involvement sort of on a regular basis? Well, I, I still oversee the operation, but my main function is really training leaders because we have enough men and women who have become very competent leaders, some who have been with me uh, 20, 30 years, and others who are new jacks, you know, who are like part of the third generation of guardian angels. So that's my job, and I have a great team, uh, international coordinator from Tokyo, Japan, where we have 23 groups, Keiji Oda, he's in the audience tonight. He's done a phenomenal job helping to bring the concept globally. And we have a number of regional leaders and local leaders who do an outstanding job. And let's face it, uh, we need to give a great round of applause to the first 13, the Magnificent 13, of which there would have been none to follow. In fact, they, there's four of them who happen to be here today if they could stand Arnaldo Salinas, who clearly was the leader without which it would have been me and my shadow sometimes. Philip Yu, Philip, if you could stand, if you're still here. Tommy Kay. And David, David, if you could stand. So he has four of the original 13, so actually I'm five. Right, right. So we're missing seven. But without these young men who dared to care that that Mickey D's, they would never have been the guardian angels, never have been the groundwork for it. Yeah. Amazing. Excellent. Uh, I see a hand back there. Hello. Um, now that New York has changed so dramatically, what do you see the role of the guardian angels is today? Well, in fact, we have diversified greatly because uh, crime did plummet. Uh, started with Giuliani. Uh, obviously, then with Bloomberg, his police department continues on with de Blasio. There have been slippages, you know, in terms of quality of life, but nothing, nothing compared to what we experienced and many of you experienced and you saw on the screen in the period piece through the 70s, 80s, and the early 90s. Uh, but for instance, we have junior guardian angels, of which you saw my oldest son, Anthony Chester Sliwa. Uh, he went through the training in Washington Heights. This is for young men, young women, 6 to 15. And we've been able to extend that all over the world now, the Junior Guardian Angels. Now, they don't patrol, but they get involved in other community activities. There's after-school teaching of them, especially many who only speak Spanish, so we immerse them in English. They learn the martial arts. They learn self-esteem. And how important for the young ladies, because they're being preyed upon not only in the streets and in school and getting perved on, but even in their own homes. And now they have the constitution and the strength to not only fight back, but to report it. And many of these uh, youngsters, they don't all go on to become guardian angels at the age of 16 when you can't patrol, but they've gone on to great careers because all of a sudden they had that confidence, that self-esteem, and they knew they could make a difference. We have our most recent group, uh, Perv Busters, and uh, we should be in Hollywood, we should be in Washington, D.C., and maybe even in Alabama. <laughs> Mostly women patrollers, who go after the weenie waivers, the guys who want to prove they don't have erectile dysfunction in the subways. And just to tell you how different it is, if you commit these same crimes above ground, it's a felony. You can go onto your computer, you can see a registry, they're all listed, you can see where they live near your neighborhood. When they do the same crimes in the subway, it's a misdemeanor. They go through the system again and again. They're predicate offenders, they're creatures of habit, they hit the same trains at the same times, and they're preying on women and children on a regular basis. And so what we do is we do the notifications, because you're not gonna see the MTA, money taking agency, or the transit police do that. God forbid they put up a, a warning flyer. And we make thousands of them and give them out and advise people on what they can do, and people feed us information. And then the program now uh, that we developed a year ago, in fact, Nancy Regula is our, uh, the head of our Guardian Angel Animal Protection Division. And now that it's getting cold, she's working double time because what she does and others do in the program is they rescue feral cats. And then they get them neutered and fixed. And they create cat colonies in the neighborhoods. 
so you don't have to use these freaking pesticides that our mayor is spending millions of dollars on that poison the land, poison the air, poison other animals. They, they die a horrible death. And what do the rats and rodents become? Immune to them, like we become immune to pharmaceutical products. These are a natural way of keeping the rodent and the mice population down. So those are just three of the most recent programs. Let's give a great round of applause because we have some of our directors here of those programs who are in the, the movie house tonight. Okay. A couple more questions we'll take. Uh, I'll go right back there, yeah. Hello, um, I'm Michael Faulkner. Uh, Curtis, you did a great job of cleaning up the streets with the Guardian Angels. I know you shifted to politics. Tell us about how you're going to clean up uh, the political scene on, the, on that, or how, how to join that, that same process. Maybe we start the Guardian Angels for politics. Uh, Michael Faulkner, in fact, just ran for the controller of the city of New York. Uh, he lost to Scott Stringer there, but ran a really great race. Uh, I happen in, in the course of the many duties I, I'm responsible for, I was elected the chairman of the New York State Reform Party uh, for the past year. It has nothing at all to do with the screwballs and the crackpots in the National Reform Party, which uh, was the offshoot of, remember, Ross Cuckoo Perot and a number of other people who've been part of that. We're independent and autonomous. There's only three beliefs that you have to be to serve in the Reform Party or to run as our candidate. You believe in term limits, believe in nonpartisan elections, and believe in initiative and referendum, which means that people get to vote on issues and take it away from the politicians and lobbyists. But if you happen to be pro-life, pro-choice, if you happen to be Second Amendment or gun control, you have a place within our party. Because see, every other party, they divide and conquer, it's partisan. You can't have a different opinion or you're ostracized, you're on the outside looking at it. And because I've always been ostracized, like a hemorrhoid in a red beret and people couldn't find enough Preparation H in the world to smear on me and hope that I'd dry up and just fly away, I know what it's like. And I was a voter like many, called an independent voter. Most millennials and hipsters now, when they register to vote, if they register to vote, they don't register as my generation did as a Democrat or Republican in the footsteps of their parents. They register as independents. And you know at the Board of Elections what they call an independent voter? Blanks. What a pejorative name. You're a blank if you're an independent. You're a free agent, but you're a blank. And I swore to myself then, no, no, there's got to be a place for people who really want a home of their own in which they're free to have their own ideology, but they just adhere to these three principles. And we won a series of elections in this recent round, and we will be a force to be reckoned with because we're going to give New York State and its politicians the most corrupt state in America now. Remember, starting with Andrew Evil Ice Cuomo, King Cuomo uh, II, and everyone on the Republican side and Democratic side in Albany, a badly needed colonic because we're coming for them. <laughs> All right, more hands. Uh, I'm going to go to you, ma'am, right here. Hi. I can't believe this house is not full. I feel like this should be next year's selection for One New York, One Film. I think all New Yorkers should see this film. Um, on that note, for folks who are not here, where can they see this? What's next? And do you have a plan to show this additional archival footage that you're talking about? Um, yeah, what's next? Um, I mean, I, I don't think it ends here. I think it's a comic book. I think it's an action figure. This, we're now binded for life and, and we're, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think we have to make everybody dare to care a little bit more. So this is, uh, this is the beginning. I think uh, right now we're being courted by, I can't say exactly who it is, um, you know, but some big places. So it will be on, it will be on cable, it will be on streaming services, and, and hopefully that's the thing. I think we might have a couple more fests. This we wanted to premiere here, and um, was that the answer to your question? Great. And the oh, archival. Yeah, oh, the archival footage. We have like two more films, yeah. like legit. Like, um, Bonus the thing we get a lot is the, the Lisa thing. How do you guys feel about the Lisa situation? Like it kind of ends off maybe. I don't, I don't know, that's a question I get a lot. What happens to Lisa? We have a lot of that. We have a lot of, you know, like the crackdown on crack, that whole episode, we have probably 10 other like specific episodes like that. Um, you know, so much great stuff with the parents, you know, um, Fran and Chester, stuff that we just, you know, 
uh, I don't know. It's, it's endless. I mean, we, we, the first cut was, I don't know, four hours or something. Yeah, at least. Um, yeah, so, so we have a lot more. Yeah. Well, you got to interview Eddie Brown. He saved my life in New Orleans. If not for him, I wouldn't be here, right? So even but more I, stuff. I think the other thing is, remember, there's a showing this Wednesday, 245. So we'll be doing the same thing for a different audience yes. who comes in the afternoon, uh, the intro and then the Q&A. And as uh, David had mentioned, hopefully uh, other film festivals, maybe internationally uh, and nationally uh, and locally, will uh, do as you guys have done and showcase it so people can come out to see it. Uh, and then who knows where it can go. But I think uh, when you talk about a New York period piece, uh, this really captures the essence of what it was like back then. Great. Excellent. We have one last question. So I'll let you, you've been waiting patiently. If we'll just go all the way back there. Hey, uh, thanks for sharing this story. Uh, it was really interesting to learn about Curtis and everything. But for me, the most interesting part was actually all the other guardian angels and just seeing how big the movement was. And I was wondering if you had, you know, thought about like focusing, like bringing in their stories and kind of what brought them to it and use Because I think just like the fact that so many people were inspired to join without knowing Curtis personally and just kind of hearing about other angels is really interesting. So just curious about that and sort of the choices around that. Um, I guess that's a me question. Um, I, uh, is that, are you asking me? Um, I, uh, we've gotten some, actually, like some of the press that's come out has, has asked that, and they feel that it's a bit of, you know, we're lionizing Curtis or whatever. Um, my take was very simple. The minute this man opens his mouth, you're going to love him or hate him. Um, I love him, and he's one of my greatest heroes, you know, as I think many, most people would feel that way. The, the story is completely controversial enough in itself, and it's unabashedly, you know, presented that way. The angels who are out here, it's amazing the support. I, I hope their stories come through again. You know, when you have 90 minutes to tell a story, there's just so much you can, you can tell, and there's only so much you can do. So, um, there's a, an amazing movie called The Kid Stays in the Picture with Robert Evans, and Robert Evans had a similar voice in my mind to Curtis, where it's just, it's that gruff, not only the voice is a, is, is a character, but the personality is a character. And when you have, you know, something like that, it's very hard to want anything else. So, so while I would love to hear everyone's stories, and there were so many people we could have interviewed, you know, I just, I just wanted to let Curtis shine. I wanted to be like a dinner with Curtis, as I experienced luckily on so many occasions. So that, that was the situation. Not to, you know, everyone here in the Red Berets, your heroes as well, and, and I hope it, it comes through. But, you know, that, that, that's, I think that's it. If you had... Well, I think what you said before, there will be many, many opportunities in the future. If this becomes the success that we think it will be, uh, there will be other outlets in which we'll have more than enough opportunity, not only to give an outlet to the guardian angels who were there from the beginning, those who are there in the interim, those who are the new jacks, but also globally. It will be interesting to hear from guardian angels in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, throughout Italy, in England, in Mexico City, in Rio de Janeiro, in Japan, as I had mentioned, in the Philippines, and in all the countries that they exist, because obviously they had nothing in common with us, and yet they were at attracted to the same vision, the same vehicle. See, what we were able to do is create a vehicle that people could glom onto and make a difference, because many people feel frustrated that one man or one woman cannot make a difference. It's like Don Quixote going up against the windmills. As long as you have that vehicle, We've proven that internationally, whether in a third world country, first world country, where there's a dictator or a democracy, this can work, and it has worked. And hopefully we'll bring all of that to light in future episodes and future ventures.